Hi, my name is Jeremy Shines, and this is I Am Loved Church. Praise God. Amen. It's a good day outside. I have not made a video this long in a while. So I hope some good stuff comes out. With that being said, God is just so good, first off. First off, I just want to thank God for everything that he's done in my life. And I hope your life as well. And if you don't know God, then there's a lot of bad things about this world. But the God that we serve is good. And when you get to experience the goodness of who he is, you'll realize that there is nothing to worry about even when the world is falling apart. With that said, there's only one God. So thank you so much for you guys who are tuning in. I can't thank you enough. Um, we, me and my family, my wife and kids, we have been going through so much. For those of you who don't know, We've been in this place called Battle Mountain, Nevada. Uh, just like any place, it has its problems. It's a pretty small town. I'm guessing around a little under 4,000 people live here. Uh, it's a mining town, so that's pretty much where all the business is coming from, the money, money. But it's about 75 miles this way towards Elko and... 50 miles this way towards Winnemucca to get to the nearest Walmart. Maybe you want to come and visit. I'm going to try my best to not say things that I don't want to say or shouldn't say. Within that being said, God is good. He is so good, so kind. He is so full of righteousness justice there's you can't find anyone like him in this world he's not of this world but he created it when i first became a christian i was rebellious i was angry i was bitter i was all the bad things i've done a lot of bad things i'm not perfect i still make mistakes but within that being said i've been diligently seeking his face in the word of god the holy bible only one. And what he has done for me, I can't say thank you enough. And that's what I want to start off this sermon with. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It has not been easy. It has been impossible. But we serve a God that is possible. Whatever temptations that I faced, whatever sins that I fell in, whatever that I've done, I constantly look to him to redeem me, to heal me, to help me, to save me, to keep me and my family safe in all those areas as well. And he just keeps pulling through. But he's not a genie. He's a person. I don't just ask for things and he just gives it to me. No. He usually gives me it through an experience, circumstance. If you ask for prayer, he puts you in situ, um, sorry. If you ask for patience through prayer, he puts you in situations to grow your patience. If you ask for financial help, he puts you in situations to learn about finances or to make more profit or money. God is a good God and he doesn't want us to walk around thinking that we can just ask him for stuff and he gives it to us. He's going to give us opportunities. And some prayers are really dangerous to ask for. And sometimes you don't even need to pray for certain things and God will put you through certain things. For those of you who don't believe or the non-believers, even the non-believers God is putting through circumstances to show them that he does exist, even though they don't believe even though they break his laws as we do every day. 
But for those of us who do believe, God wants to teach us his laws. Just because you break a law and you don't know that it exists doesn't mean you didn't break one. If a tree falls in the forest, does anyone hear it? Does it make a sound? Yes, it still happened. So when we look into God's word, we're looking to the things that are right and the things that are wrong, which he has ordained, he has sanctioned, he has put in place, and he's rid it, he wrote his laws on our heart. Us naturally as human beings, we know the difference between right and wrong, even when we don't acknowledge it all the time, actually most of the time. But when we start to learn the laws, we start to learn how to please God and how he wants us to behave. The world who doesn't know the God of the Holy Bible, they walk in according to the customs that they make for themselves, the laws that they make for themselves. But usually you find them bitter, angry, um, all the bad things that God describes us as being without him. So, within all that being said, there's a lot of great things that are starting to happen. We are in a season of harvest, which means whatever you've done in your past, whether good or for bad, these are described as seeds you've sown. Whether you said it or whether, whether you've um, committed the action, good or bad, if you've sown in the spirit or if you've sown in the flesh, we are now in a season of harvest. Now these seeds are starting to come out of the ground, come out of our hearts, come out into our lives. Some of us in, are going to be experiencing a lot of tragedy, ending relationships, and some of us are going to be entering into new relationships or leaving or moving, or some of us are going to be uprooted from the land because of our sins and our behavior. And this is constantly happening. And Paul describes, don't get tired of sowing good seed in the spirit of God who lives in you, those of you who are saved. And those of you who aren't, God is offering you an opportunity to become a child of God, to become his own people, to belong to some, uh, uh, to belong, to feel accepted. But they come with rules. Just as the military has uh, rules and our nation has rules and the jobs that we choose to work at has rules and every household should have rules. If we are to be God's people, we are to follow his rules or strive to follow his rules. We're not going to get it perfect, but we are on the process. Old Testament, we were able to obey them. We were able to follow them. But now we have the spirit of God living in us because of our faith in Jesus, and that's the only way to have the Spirit living in us, we desire more to obey them. We now have a choice. Before we were enslaved to our sin, but now God has provided a way where now we can resist it, but not within our own strength, but in the strength of the Spirit. There are many times I face temptations various kinds. And I say, God, I can't do this. And I feel the temptation, the urge to commit the action. And the spirit tells me, the Holy Spirit is a person, tells me, don't do that. And I said, I can't, I, I can't, I'm going to sin. I'm going to sin. And he says, then cry out to your savior. And I say, Jesus, help me, help me, help me overcome this, help me. And he does. He wants children in his kingdom not people who think they can do it by themselves. We can't save ourselves and we can't save the people around us. There's only one savior, one mediator between us and God, and that's Jesus. So within all that being said, God is working on a ministry in all of our lives, whether it's evangelism, shepherding people in, whether it's becoming teachers or whatever have you, traveling. God is doing that for every one of us, and it's a slow process. But he says, my soul does not delight in those who are not faithful to me, who are constantly seeking me, constantly, what do you want, God? And this is the difference between the Pharisee and, and, and God's chosen people. 
We read in the Old Testament, we see Moses, we see Elijah, we see, um, well, I don't know about Samson, but for the most times, we see God's people. They're always coming to God saying, God, what do you want me to do? And I, we do have God's word, but unfortunately, we can't always lean on the word with our own understanding. Now I'm brought into this deeper intimacy with God. I say, God, what does this mean? Because my mind will start to twist the meanings and the words in the Bible for its own gain. Oh, if I memorize scripture, then I can become God because this is God's word. But God doesn't want us to twist his words. He wants us to get the fruit out of his word, out of him. And the Holy Spirit will tell us what the passage means. Not every situation is a quoting scripture to someone. Sometimes it just requires not saying anything. Sometimes it requires uh, a little bit more gentleness. Those of us who call ourselves teachers, if we're teachers, then we ought to discern um, people's walk with Christ. I'm not going to go to my child who's two years, about to be two years old and start to give her or my infant baby a steak. No, I'm going to teach her where she's at. And I think this is the problem in our church is, and it's going to probably stay that way, but is, is we can reprimand people to the point where they don't even want to be a part of Christ anymore. We give them steak when they're, when they're barely eating baby food. And this is the concept is we need to learn how to be gentle with our correction. And we need to learn where the person is at. You can't give someone something that is, you're going to crush them if you give them something too much. You need to find out and discern where they're at. That may be what you're learning, but it's not what they need. <clears throat> so I don't want to go too far into that. And this is the fellowship that we are to enter into. You know, don't get jealous if someone else's walk is more closer to Jesus. And don't compare yourself to one another. We're all in our different pace. Just as children, they're at their different pace and walk and learning things in life. We as Christians are at our different pace and learning different things that God is teaching us. But the concept is he's disciplining us. He's trying to grow us into his character and into the things that please him. So over the course of time, when we do struggle with sin, we should struggle with it less and less and desire it less and less. God wants to be, make us a kingdom of priests. A little bit about the Old Testament. It's sort of the concept of when you first got baptized, you were an infant in Christ. Start reading your Bible a little bit, praying a little bit. But as you mature in Christ, you will mature from being an infant to first grade, second, third, fourth, and so on, middle school, high school, and then college. But then through that growth, you become less hostile, you become more loving, you become less argumentative and more um, prone to uh, things around you. Um, meaning, how do I explain this? You become more like Christ. Right now, wherever you're at, he's, he's, he's kind of, an unfamiliar person who you're kind of feeling out. You know, when you first meet someone, you don't tell them everything. Hopefully you don't. But as you get to know them, you start to trust them with more and more and more. And as God gets to see you and you know him, well, what I mean by that is he already knows you, but as you get to learn who he is, you begin to see his face more and more and more. You get to learn who he is more and more and more. It's like an onion, you can't see the center of the onion until you peel off all the outside of the layers. He reveals to you more. He lifts more veils, you know. But that comes with the discipline. That comes with following his spirit. It doesn't come overnight. God is not going to overwhelm you and say, go run 26 miles when you don't even know how to run one mile. He's growing this salvation inside of you. 
through fellowship with him in the word and prayer. I don't know where any of you are at. I'm pretty sure everyone who's watching this either doesn't know Christ, is baby in Christ, either fell away in Christ for whatever reason. God wants you and he still wants you and desires you. And the joys and the peace and the love around and in his living in him and for him just becomes more and more amazing. So if you don't have a relationship with God, you are missing out on, on basically the reason to exist. And if you want to enter into that relationship, confess that Jesus is God and accept him as your Lord and Savior each and every day. It's not a process of, oh, just today. It's an everyday surrendering. God, what is your will? What is your will for my life? What do you want me to do every day? Read his word every day. Become obedient to, to him and his spirit every day. There are a few things that changed in the Old Testament, but the concept remains the same. You know, such as God would say things like, they had to build this tabernacle, which was basically a, a church. They had to uh, do certain rituals and they could only eat certain foods. Some things got changed, but the concept remains the same. It was a shadow of heaven. God's throne was the Ark of the Covenant. The angels, they had two angels facing each other. They had the, um, the Ten Commandments were inside the Ark which was the law, a perfect law. And then they had the mercy seat, which the angels stood upon, which is where the high priest would enter. The high priest used to be a person who had to atone for their sin before they can enter into the most holies of places. These were physical things to explain spiritual attributes about heavenly um, things. We couldn't physically see them or spiritually see them in the Old Testament. But God showed us what he was like in the Old Testament, what heaven was like, what it looked like. God's throne, the angels worshiping, and, the sent, and, and, and they were on the Ten Commandments. Your throne is established by righteousness. And the centerpiece was the, was the sacrifice. The only the holies of holies could sit there. And it was representing God. And Jesus is that atoning sacrifice for sin. He is God. So when the New Testament came, Jesus came. The same thing applies, but the ark represents the person who sits on the ark. It represents the law and it represents um, the sacrifice and the angels who gather around him. It's Jesus. Jesus came to this world. It's, the Bible says that he is filled with truth, which is the law, and grace, which is the atonement for sin. And the angels gather around him, and he represents God. We needed new priests every time a priest would die, and so forth. We are, are made in his image, and we are... The new priest, we are the, we are not the high priest, which is Jesus. We are the new priest though. We are to carry his name. The ark of the, the ark now is his name. Those who carry my name. As they walked across the red, uh, the Jordan Sea, they were carrying God's name. But they had to be cleansed themselves to carry his name. And Jesus wants to cleanse you. Or Jesus wants you to remain cleansed, which is not to go back into the ways of the world. The world represents rebellion. Inside the church represents holiness. It represents heaven. Outside the church represents rebellion. And when I mean church, before it was a tabernacle, which was a building. But now it's us, the body of Christ. We represent the tabernacle. So we are to walk in the customs of heaven the Bible tells us 
a lot of shadows of things and, and Jesus reveals the full truth. If you want to enter into the kingdom of God, then it's like enlisting as a Christian into the military. We have rules, we have customs, we have behavior. This is described as the spirit, the behavior, the customs, the rules of God, the law, and the uh, character of Jesus. I guess some sort of trinity there. At first, you're a toddler in Christ, acting like the world, but you should be transitioning into acting and carrying the kingdom of God and becoming like him. You're not him. You never will be, but to become like him. The world is boastful. They're proud. They're loud. They have no peace. They're just... And when we come into this relationship with Jesus, he's weeding those things out. He's taking those characteristics characteristics out. And the one way he does that is through when we read our word, read the word of God. And when we trust in him, Jesus, as our savior, he delivers us and he sends us through wilderness, a wilderness to test our faith, to prune these worldly qualities out of our hearts. Because God is always looking at our heart. Where is your heart? And he wants to take away all these idols. I used to worship a lot. And you could worship YouTube. You could worship Facebook. You can even worship your ministry and thinking that it's yours. You can worship your marriage. You can worship Christian activity. You can worship pretty much anything. Someone said to me the other day that you could worship the Marine Corps because they were in the Marines. It was a pastor. He see people worshiping the military, people worshiping their nation, America, you know. And the first law is to what? Thou shalt have no other gods before me. The second one is thou shalt have no other graven image. People can worship even God's creation or the ocean or the stars. But it's an image because God says that no one has ever seen him. Because God is a spirit. And, though, and he wants to be worshipped in spirit and in truth. So with that being said, this message is about adopting the kingdom lifestyle and character of God, the spirit, and Jesus. We are not to walk, behave, or act like the world. We are to walk and behave and act like Jesus. And he shows us what he likes and what he doesn't like in the holy word of God. He tells us what he expects from us. And this is faith, that they may know that we believe in God, the way we love each other. If there's strife in a church, if there is division, it's really because of one reason that we have not surrendered to God and we're not following him. He wants to co-partner with us in creation. Don't do things for yourself. Don't just start something for yourself. Check in with God. All the great prophets did this, including Moses, all the great leaders and kings of the Old Testament who were good. They always checked with God. Let your will be done. What do you want me to do today? And God will tell you. People look in the Bible. The Bible says you look in the scriptures thinking you'll find eternal life, but you don't come to me. God wants us to come to him. What does this verse mean? What do you want? He wants us to, he wants us to be his children. And children are always looking to their parents or in this case, father. What does this verse mean? I don't get it. Don't just go, oh, that's what it means. And make it up for yourself. Ask him. Stop. Take your time. Don't just read it and say, I read my Bible. Have a fellowship with him. You read a passage. I don't understand. You just read it. Do you remember 
what you just read? Read it again. Read it again. Okay, still don't get it. God, what does this mean? And he'll show you word for word. Oh, okay, this. I want you to think about this word. I want you to go online or grab a dictionary and I want you to look up the different meanings until you understand what that word means. This will change your way of experiencing him, knowing who he is and your ministry and your life. He wants us to become the living word of God as he is the living word of God. Not to just have a bunch of knowledge in our mind. We could just quote, but we have no understanding of what it means. So I don't, I feel like this is, I'm going, this is a lot. I know. So with that being said, in a lot of cases, the Old Testament still applies. We weren't able before in the Old Testament, but now we have God's spirit. He said, I'll write my laws on your heart so you will desire to obey them. So we are to grow into this character of Jesus. And to grow into that character is to grow into heaven and heaven in us. This was, has been God's plan from the very beginning. Jesus came to show us how God originally intended for us to live. It was like they are misinterpreting the Old Testament. And we still do it today. And Jesus is the perfect image of fulfilling the law. It says, this is what God meant for us to live like when we look at Jesus' character. That's how God intended for the law to look. But we use the law to crush people. And that's not the God that I serve. And I hope and pray that's not the God that you serve. We are to become like him. And it's not this fake imitation like him. It's not saying something and not meaning it. Like, I hope you have a good day and not actually mean it. God wants us to mean what we say from the heart. Not to pretend that we're holy on the outside, to pretend that we're perfect. He wants us to actually be perfect. He says, be perfect, for I am perfect. I'm perfect from within, and I mean what I say from within and from without. There's a lot of condescending and sarcasm, which brings down the image of God. Cruel joking, crude joking. And God's like, that's not my character. That's the world. He says, if you love me, stop acting like that. Cleanse your hearts, you sinners, you evil, and do what's good. Although Old Testament doesn't appear anymore it's all grace okay well if you keep on living this way oh you do something bad you steal you rob some place okay you didn't know any better but now you do and you continue to live this way in orgies and immorality if it's all grace then how is God to judge the world you could just do what you want because it's because I know I can ask for forgiveness and I'll be healed. If that was the case, I would just be in a brothel all day and be like, oh, forgive me and be healed. Then what's the point? Then why did Satan get cast out of heaven? Because he can stay in hell and just keep asking for forgiveness. No, there is a judgment that will separate the sheep from the goat. If you're pursuing your way out of whatever sin it is, homosexuality, whatever it is, um, whatever your sin is, whatever you're struggling with right now, God's trying to help you. He wants us to desire him more than we desire sin. Before, we could just nothing but desire sin. And if you continually desire to sin, and you're saying things like, well, we're not going to be renewed until the, till the resurrection, until we all die, God was trying to renew us right now. Right now. He's trying to cleanse us right now. But we keep 
quenching the spirit and going back into sin, going back and back in. You may struggle for 10 years, but over the course of that 10 years, 20 years, you should struggle less and less. And if you're struggling more and more, then you're probably not saved. You probably don't have the Holy Spirit living in you. You should become more kind, more loving, and more gentle, more and more, less acting like the world, looking to please him who's God, the living God, more and more. And if you're not, you need help. You need to repent of your sin. You need to look at the, the Holy Bible, look at all the laws and just say, man, I've, I keep breaking them. And you need to start really meaning what re repentance, really earnestly desiring to be healed and to really earnestly desire to stay away from the sin. Here is the solution to when you get tempted. Pray. Pray. Pray for a rescuer. Pray for a helper. Pray for Jesus to come because he'll rescue you if you want to be rescued. He'll help you if you want help. He'll teach you if you want to be taught. He's always willing, but are we always wanting to be helped? Do we want to be? Do we want to be helped? Do we want a savior, or do we want our, do we want to be our own savior? The Pharisees wanted to be their own savior. They wanted to be God, but there's only one savior, who is God. I remember the other night I was being tempted to watch porn. And it was just consuming me. The temptation was getting out of my hand. And literally, right before I was going to go and do th that, the Spirit just said, you know you have a Savior that can save you from this temptation. And the pride in me was resisting it. And then the clarity kicked in. Jesus, help me. And the tempter left, fleed, because the presence of God showed up. That presence isn't me. It's not you or anyone else in this world. It's in Jesus, in Jesus alone. And he sends the helper. Do you want help? Not just for sexual sin, but for all sins. And any time you face a sin. Anytime you face your enemy, do you want a helper? Do you want a partner to help you? Not of just marriage, but of the spiritual when you're, when you're not around your um, spouse or girlfriend or boyfriend or fellowship with somebody of the Christian faith. Wherever you're at, do you want to be helped? Jesus says, I am always with you. But the question is, are you asking me for help? Most of the time we're not because we're too stubborn and too prideful. I got this, God. I got, I can do this. I can run this ministry by myself. I can understand this Bible by myself. I don't need anyone. I can fellowship by myself. And God's like, okay, do it your way then. And every single time, we end up on a path to destruction, and sorrow and grief and no peace at all. He created us because he wants to partner with us. The question is, do we want a partner who is always willing, a helper who's always wanting? Do you want that? You may never, you will never, not may, you will never find someone like Jesus if you don't know him already. You will never, ever, your spouse will let you down, your boss, whoever, you will even let yourself down, your kids, everyone will let you down, but Jesus will never let you down. And that's a promise, I promise. I can't promise many things. <laughs> But I will promise that this is the God that I serve. God, Jesus, will never let you down. And even if you think that he's letting you down, check again. 
you're probably doing your own thing and you're not on his path. His path is peace, is love, is joy. And anything outside of that is your own path that you've chosen, is the world's path that you followed the people. You're not following Jesus. Your ministry will grow if you're following Jesus. Your ministry will grow. Your marriage will grow. Everything on the God's path grows. And if you're feeling more, less of peace, joy, and love, and kindness, you're on another path. And that path is always leading away from God, away from truth, away from love. If you have this burden on your life, you are not on God's path because the path that we walk is by faith. We follow the Spirit by faith. We don't see Him, but we know He's there. And we know He helps us anytime we need it. And the fact that we're not asking Him, and sometimes we are asking Him, and He tells us, and we don't like it, and we stay off His path. Do you like to be corrected? Do you think you need to be corrected? Do you want help? Are you actually doing what God wants you to do? He's always telling us over and over and over and over and over again. If we can't hear it, then he will show us. If he's not showing us, then he'll tell us and convict us over and over and over again, just like he did Pharaoh. Do it, Pharaoh. Do it. Do it. Let them, my people go. Let my people go. Gave him many reasons and he wouldn't do it. And finally, God had enough and hardened his heart. And therefore, he's living in condemnation and judgment for eternity. Do not fight God. You will lose. Whether you lose and stay judged forever, or just lose and finally surrender and go, okay, I'll do it. I will forgive this person. Okay, I'll do it. I'll finally do what you tell me to do. I want to be a pastor. Sometimes you just, no, you're not ready yet or no. I want to be an evangelist. No. And that's the concept is God's plan for our lives will always be better than every desire that we have for this world. Or the things that we want to do. Not every Christian activity is God's activity. Not every plan is God's plan. Are we humble enough to ask? And when we receive, are we humble enough to act? That person that you keep ignoring, stop. Stop ignoring them. Humble yourself and love them. Acknowledge them. And God will keep giving you the opportunity. Those who are trusted with much will be given much. Basically, those who do what I say, I bless them. And I keep blessing them. And I give them more responsibility. I give them more peace. I give them more love. But those who dishonor me, they don't do what I say. And I start to take away from their life more and more and more. The choice is yours to obey or disobey. I can't thank you enough. This has been a wonderful time speaking, teaching, helping, growing, learning, going through wildernesses, going through times of struggles. I go through every single thing that I taught. There's not one thing that I teach that I don't go through, that I haven't been through. Everything I say is true because I went through it. And now I look at the scriptures and I respect it. I struggled a lot. I disagreed a lot. I was in the military. I had a lot of bad leadership. And it was like, obey your government, obey your leaders. I was like, oh, dad, man. So I know. But I don't worship them. Now I know who I worship. And now I get it. I'm like, oh, you may have a bad leader. You may have bad whatever. 
But the God that we serve is great. He ain't going to make no flaws. He don't make no flaws. Man makes flaws. We make flaws. I make flaws. But God ain't make no flaws. He's amazing. He's great. And until you can experience that, then you won't trust him. And where you're at right now, you're wondering, why is this happening in my life? Why, why am I not over there yet? God's like, you can't run a mile yet. Why am I going to give you a marathon? You can't do this yet. You can't even manage your own house yet. Why am I going to give you a church? Get right with your family first, with your wife. Love your wife first. Love your kids first. And then when you get into a church or wherever you're supposed to be, then you will understand my plans. Some of you guys, you think you're so wise. You think you're so smart. You're like, oh, I'm good at this scripture stuff. I know this. This this is nothing. This is all. But you're probably not applying any of it. You can know it all you want and not act. As James describes, he says, you look at the perfect law, the perfect image, like looking into the mirror and forgetting what you look like and forgetting to do what the Bible tells you to do. I'm ready, God. No, you're not. Not yet. Patience with the process. Learn it. You're not going through a season to go th just, just get through it. You're going through a season to get the fruit out of it. It's not a race of, of speed. It's a race of patience. It's not just A to B. Moses, when they went to the wilderness, they didn't just go to A to B. No, they circled around for 40 years going in circles and then tell everyone was obedient to God and then they exited into the promised land and that's why we're, we go through wildernesses God's like you still didn't learn your lesson so I'm going to send you through another forest and then you say the same thing why does this keep happening to me it's because you didn't learn your lesson just like someone who goes to school third grader whatever your grade is and you have to keep repeating the class over and over and every year you may, the, the authorities of this world may, may pass you and just say, just go, but God won't. God's going to keep you there until you finally learn how to love, how to forgive, how to have patience. And then he'll scoot you on a little. But just because he scoots you on doesn't mean you've perfected in it. Sometimes he'll bring you right back. And I tell you what, when you first run that mile, it's hard. but then you get strong enough in Christ that you can run two. Then you get strong enough, then you can run five and 10 and 15 and so on. And it's always hard. So with that being said, appreciate what you have in the seasons that you go through. Appreciate it, learn from it, absorb it, walk in it. Don't go back to the elementary ways of this world. Walk in the newness, in the redemption. Walk in love. Learn and retain what you've learned. And you'll be blessed. Don't take anything for granted. God will only grow you as fast as you want to be grown, as, as much as you're seeking him in his word. A good church is a church that is constantly in his word, constantly searching scripture, constantly. Just like you can't count the dirt in your probably front yard or wherever there's dirt pile, even if it's small, so you will never understand the scriptures. There's always something to learn in the Bible. There's always something to learn. You die when you stop learning. You can't lead unless you read. Keep seeking, keep growing, keep learning. You, that's a good thing that you never feel like you have it. That's, that's, that's growing. And keep going and going. I always watch these sermons and I'm like, man, I could do better than that. Good. That's what God wants you to do. Until you meet him face to face, you'll never be perfect. And you're not perfect even when you meet him. 
you're just perfect because you're in his presence it's all about him all about him all about him all about him humble yourself and watch god grow everything but the proud will be thrown down they will keep losing more and more stuff first seek the kingdom of god and his righteousness and his will and all these things will be added to you god bless